Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this session. Uh, my name's Georgia Simmons. And I'm Mays. Um, and before we go any further, we'll begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that this event is taking place on, um, the peoples of the Kulin Nation, uh, who have been here for tens of thousands of years. Uh, we uh, extend our respects to their elders past, present and becoming and acknowledge that this land was never ceded. So, as we said, um, I'm Georgia. I was the narrative co-director and the voiceover performance director on Wayward Strand. And I was the video technical director and composer and audio director on Wayward Strand. Uh, so in this talk, we're going to just go through what our voiceover production process was. We've found out from various sources that um, our film has approximately, what is it, 18 feature films worth yes. of voiceover dialogue does. in it. Yes. Um, did I say our film? Yes. <laughs> our game has um, 18 feature films of dialogue in it, um, which we didn't know at the time that we were recording, which is probably just as well, but we were aware that it was a lot. Um, so we're just going to take you through our workflow from pre-production through the studio time and then implementation um, and talk through that whole process today. Mm. Would you like to do the narrative complexity? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so Wayward Strand, uh, for those of you who haven't yet had a play, um, it takes place on an airship in the 1970s in regional Victoria, and you play as Casey, who is a 14-year-old girl whose mum is the head nurse of the hospital that's on that airship, and you spend three days in your summer holidays going up to the airship and spending time on the aged care ward and <coughs> hanging out with the patients up there. Um, and what's so complex about this game and the reason that there is so much voiceover for us to record is that it takes place in real time and all of the non-player characters have their own journeys and their own business that they're doing throughout that whole three-day cycle. Um, so, you know, in your average video game, especially a, a narrative adventure game, the NPCs are kind of standing there waiting for you and they have their bit that they say and then you move on. Whereas in our game, no matter where you are and no matter what you're doing, all of the NPCs have their own business to be doing um, and the main player agency in our game comes from where you go and who you listen to and who you talk to. But if you, for example, walk into a patient's room and they're halfway through a conversation, they're just halfway through that conversation and you don't get to like re-trigger it from the start or anything like that. Um, so this also posed a lot of technical challenges for recording. Yeah, so uh, the first challenge was just being that it's a really, 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 really huge amount. Um, we got to work with Tifa Newsom, who's an ADR specialist um, over in Brizzy, and it's the second game that we've gotten to work on together. Um, but she was able to help us design a Pro Tools pipeline where we were using, we were able to export um, into spreadsheets all of the dialogue mm -hmm. that Georgia and Jason had written in Ink, which was the um, narrative engine that we were using with Unity, uh, into spreadsheets, all with um, our magic number that says how long dialogue might go for pre-VO. Um, and then that would then import as markers into Pro Tools. Um, we found that the maximum amount of tracks in Pro Tools was 760 because that was relevant to us. <laughs> um, so we maxed out the number of markers per Pro Tools session to 500, um, just in case for some reason we did have a different line on every single track. We weren't totally sure of our pipeline. Um, but that, yeah, had to be a whole kind of designed process where we had dress rehearsals that we'll talk about later. Um, and then on top of that, because we had, you know, just an awesome cast um, during a pandemic, we had to record across four studios. So we recorded in Melbourne, Sydney, Vienna and London um, because we weren't paying for any actors to come down to Melbourne and, of course... Um, with a game that features so many old people, they don't all want to get on a plane during a pandemic either. Um, so for that, we had a whole lot of RX and Pro Tools presets um, designed around each studio, which I can talk about later as well, um, for us to cohesify, make the audio cohesive so that everyone sounded there, like they're in the same room. Yeah, there was also um, a big challenge with the narrative complexity for actor comprehension. Um, a lot of the actors we were working with had done... That a lot of them were very experienced actors, but they'd worked more in theatre or television or film. Um, and when we first started printing out the scripts, which we'll get into in a little bit, but um, the non-linear path of the dialogue 
was just sort of going to be completely incoherent to an actor who is going to try and give a proper performance to the words, no, I don't want a cup of tea. Yes, please. Thanks for the tea. You know, like it sort of just doesn't really make sense when it's out on the page. So we had a lot of challenges to overcome in terms of how do we communicate to these actors who are very good at embodying a character and giving voice to a character, but maybe have never played a video game or recorded anything non-linear, what is the flow of any given scene or of the narrative as a whole? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to dive in to the recording process technical thing. Um, so we did a heap of dress rehearsals, basically. We, after we had designed what the script looked like so that all of the non-linear parts were kind of tabbed in and tabbed out and um, Georgia and I and then an actor who helped us with figuring out the pipeline... Um, had figured out the order of which we would go through a script and how we would mark it out and things like that. And we had um, some vocabulary also that we'd use between the engineers so we could say, OK, line number four, let's roll that again. Um, on, on the actor scripts, we had all of the lines numbered, which is, as a musician, it's like reading a score we all might have different scores, but at least the bar numbers are the same, you know? Um, so we'd have vocabulary like, okay, uh, it's Pro Tools Clip Lily 10, um, and then Instance 4 will be the uh, version of that line that we wanted or something like that. Um, so creating all of this shared vocabulary as well. Uh, with the A-B testing, um, because we wanted to get as dry as possible VO um, in film, you do think about having a bit of a room tone and you want to match the room tone of wherever it was actually filmed if you're doing ABR. Um, for us, because all of the reverbs and compressions and all of the um, background sounds will be happening in real time, we just want that VO to be as dry as possible. And so that meant that when we approached the studios, we would get them to use a Neumann U87 mic, which is a pretty standard mic for studios. Um, we would get them to record between 50 and 60 centimetres away from the mic, which was a really naturalistic sound. That sounds a little far away when in your head you're like, half a metre, what the hell? Um, but... You know, we did some Googling and we saw that Pixar uses that as well and it's this kind of um, not quite VO, like, not sorry, not quite narration voiceover style that you might find in film and not quite close to the mic cartoony style but a little bit more natural than that um, and there's a few other kind of naturalistic things to talk about as well in the direction pass. Um, so... And then another issue was while the Neumann mic is standard across most recording studios, interfaces aren't. So we then talked about how much gain to use. If you use a higher amount of gain, you're going to get more colour from the interface. And if you, use, if you use a lower amount of gain, you're going to get more of the room tone. And so then in post, as engineers, we're like, OK, which one is easier to get rid of? And we figured the room tone, but it is really a choice. So quite a low gain, really never went above kind of 11 o'clock. Um, and we would have the studios send us back a few lines of, OK, we've done this at 40 centimetres and at 60 centimetres. They've used a focus right and however many other um, interfaces. And we have the Neumann mic. And... It was pretty seamless, um, but then for a couple of studios, we were getting some kind of reflection from a window or something, and you know, all the studios say, yes, we have the deadest rooms, it's going to be fine, we do so much VO, but it's like, not in this exact setting, so for one of the studios, we were like, need more curtains, more panels, more of this, um, but that A-B testing was something that I hadn't thought of before. Um, but my old mentor was like, yeah, you can just get them to send you some lines. So that was good. Um, yeah, we did a few dress rehearsals with the actor, myself, and then my assistant engineer, Alison Walker. 
um, who if you need to hire a sound designer in Melbourne, Alison Walker, grab her. Um, and with that and Harriet and our actor and then with Georgia and Jason um, doing direction, we were able to really iterate on the process of each day and try and make it as seamless as possible. And we would go back to Tifa Newsom, the ADR specialist, <laughs> and be like, all right, this worked, this didn't work. We're using the markers in a slightly different way now because she's used to film and we were doing games. And yeah, so there was all of these kinds of dress rehearsals that were really, really important. Um, we used Pro Tools, and that's not a games industry standard, as most of the people in this room would know. Uh, the games industry is pretty well known for not using Pro Tools, <laughs> um, which is pretty fun. So Alison and I learned to use Pro Tools in a week. Um, mm. And we, there's two different kinds of kind of um, ink scenes in our game. There's scenes that can happen at any time of day, but um, they rely on you having interacted in some other way. And there are scenes that are the characters' schedules and they will only happen at the times that those characters will do those things. Um, so for the scheduled scenes, we would have one Pro Tools session per scene and we would open each one up as we went, um, which meant I had to manually make, I think, 400 Pro Tools sessions and import all the markers and then put in all of our um, actor and studio presets into each session which I got really good at doing. We have a lot of presets and I had basically refined it down to three button presses per um, scene. And then for the shared non-scheduled scenes, um, that's where we just maxed it out at 500 markers per session. Um, for the post process, that's where we lent pretty heavily on RX. So we had um, dialogue cleanup, a, um, in Rx, it's a module flow. So we were able to just uh, make a preset for each character and it would take into account the studio that they're in, how much sibilance was in that studio, how much extra noises. One of our studios, um, the train managed to come through sometimes. <laughs> um, another studio, they just couldn't quite get all of the reflection out. Um, just different little pieces and then with such a wide range of um, ages and genders and just different characters, everyone's performance was quite different as well. So some people would be quite booming the entire time. Some people would be quite quiet the entire time. Some people had really rich voices. Some people had quite thin voices. Um, so in the Pro Tools session, we would send everything after we had sliced it all up, which uh, we had another assistant um, VO editor who did a lot of slicing. After it was all sliced up, it would get sent to RX and then come back to Pro Tools where it then went through a couple of fab filter EQ and um, compression. And then it would be all exported out numerically. So uh, it would all go into folders and then have the different numbers. And then that would be imported into Unity, which we would then uh, test. But yeah, if you want all of that kind of said with lots more images and videos, um, we've published on the Audio Kinetic site part one of that. Um, and there's three more parts to go. But yes, I think I've taken up half the presentation on this slide now. So, no, no, it's yeah. great. Um, yeah. I feel like a fun bit of trivia is that the actor who helped us with those dress rehearsals is Harriet Wallace-Mead, who plays the nurse Lily, which just feels fun because she's like the helpful person around the hospital, like yeah. helping everyone out. And then she's also just like incredibly helpful in the VO process. And she like moonlights as a stage director as well. So like, or, or, um, what's that called? Stage manager. So it was like pulling us up on things of like, oh, have you ch double checked this thing or whatever? Um, so she was yeah. great to have in that yeah. process. She was really good at pretending that she had like never come into the process and we were like, all right, dress rehearsal from the start again. Alison and I would come in, turn on all the studio, load the first scripts, welcome the actor and all of that. 
Um, and she'd be like, oh, hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Just really good. Acting as an actor. Yes. <laughs> um, so in terms of, I'll, I'll speak a little bit now about how we inducted the rest of the actors into this process. So I spoke a little bit before, and Maze has just mentioned the line numbers on our scripts. Um, so um, as we mentioned, we wrote all the scripts in ink. Um, and when we exported those, we, uh, we, not me, Thomas, I think, mm -hmm. wrote um, an HTML, a program to convert all those ink files to HTML in a way where each individual dialogue line had its own unique number within the scene. Um, and then there was um, indentation to give um, like a visual cue to when a certain uh, sort of choice tree was being enacted and then when it sort of reconnected to the main sort of trunk of the narrative of that scene. Um, but then in terms of how we explained that nonlinearity to actors, what we did is for each scene prior to our day in the studio, we would go through the scene or I would go through the scene um, and select a list of line numbers that came together to, to form one coherent way through the scene, start to finish, sort of that trunk of the scene. And so when, when we started recording any given scene, I would say to the actor, okay, can you just highlight the following lines in your script? One, two, three, seven, 11, 42, 43, you know, whatever. They would mark those off and they would read the scene in that way. And I wrote, I, I read in the, um, the dialogue of whoever they were speaking with. Um, and once we were happy with the performance through that branch of the narrative in the scene, we'd go back up to the start and say, okay, so we skipped lines four and six. This is what your character's saying instead of line three go and sort of record in those bits that we jumped over. Um, interestingly, everyone from the people who had played video games before or maybe even had some involvement in video games to people who had never touched any kind of game console um, got pretty accustomed to this process and to this script format within the first session or two that we were working with them and we found that almost everyone needed that at the start but by the end could read through any given scene top to bottom in a non-linear way and just adjust the performance. Um, but we're still really glad that we did it because we feel like taking out that non-linear sort of complexity in the first few sessions gave the actors time to focus and settle into their character, character voice, also the studio environment and our team. Um, and then they all had their own speed with which they kind of released from that process and just wanted to... Um, pile through it from, from start to finish. Mm. I'll add on um, being able to convert all of the ink files, not only to the spreadsheets that I was using for Pro Tools, but also the HTML, meant that um, when Georgia was saying, ah, oh, let's like make these headings more bold or let's do this kind of thing, we were able to just use style sheets, um, so CSS as well, to customise the script really easily. And so we would have been able to change font sizes and things like that. And also when you print as PDF an HTML page, um, Tom, who had made the parsing tool, was also able to put page breaks between each scene. So then it just printed really, really nicely um, for everyone. So mm. yeah, that was a reason to use HTML. Yeah, that's right. And some of where that came into play was, um, or the main way that I'm thinking of it besides scene headings and things was that we bolded every line that was spoken by that actor. So we created mm -hmm. a custom script per actor and all their lines were in bold. And the reason for doing that is that most actors are accustomed to reading a script and they can find their character name. But um, in film and TV and theatre and basically any other script format, if your character is speaking, your name is once and then everything you say is after your character name um, and then the dialogue flows on. Whereas the ink files had to be formatted such that every time that we have a new caption come up on screen, those of you that have played the game will be familiar with you know the speech bubbles that come off the actors uh, come off the characters as they're talking um, each new speech bubble is its own line of dialogue that has the character name again um, and so that was another thing that any actors that we were working with would have been unfamiliar with and so that ability through the html style sheets to just like bold every line that was relevant to that actor came in handy as well mm. um, in terms of casting we can probably both speak to this a little bit um, the game uh, is set in australia it's set in an aged care ward um, and we have a lot of different factors at play in terms of um, older characters, characters who were not born in Australia. There's um, an Indigenous character. Um, and our first principle with our casting was that we wanted to cast actors as close to the um, lived experience of the character as we possibly could. 
Um, so for example, we really didn't want to be having any sort of like 20 or 30 year old actors putting on old person voice, um, if we could help it at all. Um, and so, and also, you know, our, um, Indigenous character, we very specifically worked with the Bunurong Land Council and with other Bunurong community groups to make sure that that character who in the game is Bunurong was being played not just by any Indigenous person but by a Bunurong person um, because that is like a very particular experience. Um, and, and there was a particular sound to the voice that the Bunurong Council, Land Council really wanted to achieve with that character, um, just taking into account the, the cultural background of being a young Bonnerong person in the 1970s um, and what what that what we can imagine that would have sounded like and talk, we got to talk through the process um, to some elders who were of an age where they were Ted's age at the time that the game was yeah. set. So they were able to give us a bit of insight into that as well. Um, and so, yeah, we, we managed to achieve that in pretty much all cases that um, all of the actors that we worked with had some shared lived experience with the character they were portraying. Um, I mean, there were some choices to make, for example, um, our character of Esther, we have a storyline throughout the game, which is quite subtle, but it basically speaks to what is the experience of someone who's an older person in the 1970s who has, a, who has questions about their gender or who doesn't feel like they are a woman, despite having been characterised as a woman for their whole life. But some of the language that we have available today around uh, non-binary and uh, genderqueer and all these sorts of things are not available to that person. And how do you sort of reckon with that lived experience? So that was a case where we prioritised finding an actor who had a lived experience of, um, you know, in our case, the, the actor that we found was a, a transgender woman, Michaela Ledwidge, who gave an amazing performance. And she's not as close in age to that character as some of the other actors are close in age to the other elderly characters. But in that instance we felt that it was important to prioritize that lived experience of the character um, in terms of what we've got down here as the um, cartoony performance style we did some voiceover recording for the game all the way back in 2017 was it mm. um, when we made a vertical slice of the game for various sort of funding and promotional um, reasons um, and at that time we worked with some of the actors that we worked with this time and some other actors um, and we learnt a lot through that process because we found that a lot of those performances had sounded great in the studio when we were face to face with a real human being and watching them give the performance. But when they were laid over this particular visual style, they came across a little flat um, and the performance style was a little too naturalistic. Um, and when you have these um, illustrations and these animations that have, you know, an upper limit as to the kind of emotion that can be conveyed. And I think the animators in our team have done an incredible job of, of mm -hmm. bringing these, um, these sprites to life, but at the end of the day, they are not human people that you can see um, in, in real space. And so there's a certain uh, gap between the realism of a, a, an in-person performance and the style of a animated performance, and that gap needs to be made up by the voiceover. So in the studio this time, we were um, pushing our actors towards a, a much more heightened performance style in a sort of cartoony, we, we use this word cartoony with them and that made sense to a lot of them in terms of just pushing the energy level beyond what you would do for film or maybe even for theatre. It's sort of closer to a theatre performance than a film performance, but maybe even beyond that again. Um, and we're really happy with the result. It actually comes mm. off quite naturalistic in the game, but it's because they've made up that gap um, between the animation and the and the real experience. And that was also a theme across the rest of the game as well. If anyone was at high score on Saturday and saw me talk about the audio design, it was exactly the same thing where we started off with quite hospitally sound and then realised that we needed to tone it back to more cosy than hospitally. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of like little tweaks of really just trying to nail the tone of the game. Mm. Um, something that's not on this slide, but that I want to just talk to you before we move on to the um, production and implementation part of the talk, um, is about what happens in the process and in the studio when you work with such a diverse array of performers with such diverse lived experience. And the primary thing that happens is you get the best product. You get a really outstanding performance and you get something that really enriches the game. What you also get is um, a need to be very, very attentive in the studio to the needs of whoever's in front of you. Um, and we found that across various different axes, everyone was different. We had some people who had um, immense decades of experience with acting, but very little technical know-how. 
and needed more breaks to make up for, you know, uh, like a, a reduced capacity. Um, we had people who had no experience at all, but like boundless energy, um, but needed to be sort of reeled in a little bit. We had people who, um, you know, it's there's a lot to it that is very instinctual as well. Like who are the actors who are going to give a better performance overall if they're allowed to just sort of be a bit chatty and work at a slower pace? And who are those actors like... Um, Jennifer Valetic, who plays um, Dr. Margot Bouchard, um, just did her whole performance in four hours. Done, dusted, one session, the end. Um, and uh, so there, there are those people who want to work at that pace and get it done, mm. and she was amazing to work with. Um, and also even down to things like... Um, yeah, I suppose there are a lot of things that would have probably been barriers for actors getting involved in a process like this that we just made sure weren't barriers. Like, we did have one performer where there were parts of the script that were very um, very verbose and that was a challenge for that actor and we developed a process with that actor that made them more comfortable of me reading the lines to them and then them saying the lines back. So I was, I was reading the line with zero sort of performance interpretation, not telling them how to deliver the line, but just literally so they could hear the words rather than having to take them off the page and then them give the words back with the performance. So just thinking through you know, what are the things that you can do in the room to make that performer the most comfortable? And that accounts for a lot of um, the performances that we got because those performers, um, we, we made sure to make them as comfortable as we possibly could with the process so that they could just focus on their own job. Yeah, and, you know, sometimes those things would also impact the editing in post. And because Alison and I were both there the entire time, um, oh, we were also taking breaks. We found that we each had about a two-hour limit of being able to listen really hard and use Pro Tools. <laughs> um, <laughs> took about two hours before we started to realise that we weren't couldn't quite listen as hard anymore. Um, but, yeah, we were also able to note, like, all right, we're going to have to have these considerations when editing. And um, for some of the scenes where it was very, like, okay... Maze is going to have to edit these because I was there in the room and I understand what's happened um, and we won't hand that one over to the editors in Brisbane because it's just too complicated. Um, there's also a scene that's entirely in Danish, which <laughs> uh, was up to me and I still fucked it up, but it was fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, having any confidence as to what the performance was sounding like in that context was challenging but you know the other thing is just trust we just trusted our performance so yeah, and yeah. that seems to have really paid off yeah we got a lot of feedback from the performers and from the remote studios that we were incredibly organized really seamless and when the remote studio engineers so i would be in there for sound checks but pretty much nothing else and then georgia and jason would take over um they would get into our rhythm of you know constantly saying okay quick four and then being like instance, blah, blah, blah. Um, they would really, really quickly get into that rhythm. And that was really remarkable um, for them and very pleasing for us because <laughs> yeah. it was scary. But, uh, yeah, we would have a couple of technical meetings in the lead up to those as well. All right. I'm noticing as I look at my own slides that I've gone over some of the content that's on this one, uh, directing uh, actors. Whoops. Um, but that's yeah. okay. Talk us through a day in the studio. Okay, um, so Alison and I would get to the studio an hour early um, when, when it was in Melbourne, which is um, most, most of the recording was done in Melbourne. Um, we would turn on all of the studio and everything, um, do sound checks. We were able to leave our gear there at the studio. Um, what was interesting was that some of the studios we looked at, they were like, ah, oh, we're used to bands, so you'll probably come in at night. And we were like, no, we're going to do nine to five. <laughs> yeah. um, so that was kind of interesting. Um, and, yeah, so we would do that. I would make sure that all of the Pro Tools sessions were ready for that day as well. Um, and we'd have our own marked up scripts as well. But basically, as we start recording we would say to Jason, who had another spreadsheet, all right, we're on Lily clip four and Pro Tools will automatically um, number each clip. So if we accidentally hit record, we would also clarify, I've skipped five, we're doing six. Um, and so then he would be able to notate 
what was the preferred take on which clip, we would start the recording from the relevant marker number, which aligned to the number of the line in the script, um, and then just record from there. So we knew that um, oh, we got 10 minutes before we start questions. Yeah. Um, we knew that we would, um, yeah, rather than having each line actually align with the markers, which is ideal in film, because the timing never changes, you've already filmed the thing, uh, we had to be a little bit more flexible than that. But because the process was so... The whole reason for this entire process is that the um, Pro Tools sessions were now really navigable. So with the spreadsheets, with the markers, with the clip names and numbers in post, we were able to be like, all right, so most things are on Lily Clip 9, and then there's a few lines that are on 10, 11, 12, 13. So I will find that clip, slice it up, then slice the other ones. Um, yeah, and that was really, really clear. Instead of having to listen to days and days and days, we did 30 days of recording. Um, it was really important that you could just find where the line was um, really easily. Yes. Yeah, that's yes. um, in terms of, and, and I guess there's just that thing of, um, which I've already spoken to, of the evolution over time. And the main evolution was just um, getting more into the rhythm of that. And mm. um, because we booked half day sessions with each of our actors and some of the actors, some of the actors did their sessions very close together, but I'd say the majority of our actors were spaced out over that 30 days. So they, I think they actually got a little bit of like rendering and processing time in between sessions as well to where they would then come back into the studio the next time they saw us and they would have it a little bit more in their bodies as well. So mm -hmm. we did pick up with that over time as well. Yeah, it was interesting. Like all of the actors would come in slightly shy as well mm -hmm. um, and then warm up to us really quickly um, or uncertain about the whole weird video game thing. You know, <coughs> some of them have got 60 years of experience or more and you mm -hmm. just like... Shit, superstars coming in. Yeah. Um, and, but, yeah, it, I think it, we had the most amazing relationship with all of the actors and engineers at the end, like, better than we could have ever hoped for, um, which was really lucky. Yeah. Okay, so, tools-wise, um, I've already mentioned all of them, but just to clarify, um, our game engine is Unity. Uh, the scripts were written in ink. Um, the audio is implemented using WISE. Um, like most games that have a huge mass amount of voiceover, um, the VO was actually handled in Unity and then sent as external instruments into WISE, um, which if you've seen the Blizzard... Um, it's not a round table, but their showcase of how they use WISE, it's the same. Um, we used Pro Tools and RX and FabFilter Suite um, for all of the editing. Uh, and then, on top of that, um, Tom had made a parsing tool to put all of the scripts into HTML and then we'd make them into PDFs. Um, and then the spreadsheets that I needed for Pro Tools and then the spreadsheets that were needed for notation as well. So, yeah. I think a lot of different entry points into the data. Yes. Um, I'm super proud of our team. And I think, you know, when people have come to us for advice on how to deal with a huge amount of VO, the key thing has been the huge team that we have. Um, so Georgia being the director of the actors, um, Jason being kind of assistant director of... Uh, everything, um, <laughs> uh, but mostly mostly the actors. Um, myself being director of the audio pipeline and, and technical director, and then Tifa Newsom was the editing supervisor of all the ADR, and so it was really key. We had so much back and forth and iteration of what the pipeline was going to be. Um, and then she had an assistant, Kira Balami, in... Brisbane, who did a lot of slicing, and my assistant, Alison Walker, who was a uh, co-engineer, um, as well as doing a whole lot of foley and sound design on the project as well. Um, 
And then, yeah, Thomas doing a few little extra parsing tools. Jason did a whole lot of, like, Google spreadsheet tools as well in that Google language that is not Swift, Flutter mm. or something. Um, so, yeah, we had a massive programming technical team and audio technical team, <coughs> the actor direction team. Um, yeah, that's really important, I think. Um, yes, if anyone knows me, you know that I love technical audio a lot and mm -hmm. um, I'm a big advocate for having a lot of programming support involved. Um, this just highlighted that a lot. Um, implementation wise, uh, so each scene got a, just a folder directory that it would go in and then each line had its number. So for audio people having files named the same thing, I had a lot of files called one.wav, um, mm -hmm. is terrifying, but uh, that actually makes a lot of sense in our pipeline. Um, the addresses do matter, um, but that meant that Unity would be pointed at all of these addresses and then um, slot them into the Unity timeline tool um, is how that would be triggered. And then we had a couple of tools that would um, detect if a scene had more or less lines than it wanted or that it was expecting. So either um, a line wasn't sliced right um, when we were doing it in Pro Tools or um, two were exported together, sometimes in Pro Tools for unknown Pro Tools reasons. Um, it would just morph two clips together randomly, totally mm. random. Um, or, yeah, so if there was any less or more, that was my first port of call of like, all right, I'll check that scene and I'll fix those WAV files. Um, but then after that, it was a manual checking. So... Um, we have we have dedicated QA at Ghost Pattern, um, but also now that it's released, to have tens of thousands of gamers telling us everything that we've done wrong. <laughs> um, Thrilling. Yeah, but sometimes like a line would be sliced in half, so you would have had an extra line, but then later on in the scene, two were combined together, so it would sync back up, and it wouldn't show up on any of our tools. Um, one good thing is that because each scene is discrete. Um, any dialogue sound being out of sync with the speech bubbles would recover in the next scene. So there was never a point where, okay, now four and a half hours of gameplay is out of sync. It would always recover at the end of the scene, um, which is actually similar, similar to a lot of other bugs in the game. Um, having these discrete scenes meant that things would recover pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Oh, should we do that? Question time. Question time. Yeah. Um, thank you all so much for being here and for listening to our talk. Um, there's going to be a Q&A mic that's going to be shifted now. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> uh, kia ora. Hello. Hey, uh, hey. Well done, by the way. That's a, a huge one. Uh, just out of curiosity, I mean, with how much was recorded there, uh, how much was on the cutting room floor? Did you guys use all of it or did you find that like some parts you were kind of like it's not working and we'll move it to somewhere else? Or? So pretty much no recorded line of audio in terms of what the text was was on the cutting room floor. Almost yeah. none. Yeah. Um, a lot is on the cutting room floor in terms of takes and in terms of performance yeah. and repeating the line. Um, but because there was already so much and we knew there was already so much um, we wanted to, our workflow was to finalize the script completely mm. before setting foot in the studio. Um, the only things that really changed in the studio is that, that a lot of our actors helped us with cultural things. So mm. for example, um, we worked with an actor, so the, there's the character of Devon, the cook, um, who is Irish, and we worked with an actor who is Irish, and he was able to um, change some of Devon's lines into Irish um, yeah. and things like that. Yeah, and Ted added, or Shane, the actor for Ted, added some Bonarang language in there, and our Austrian actor, Erhard Hartmann, um, as well as the Austrian engineer, were able to correct us on an Austrianism, <laughs> um, which we got wrong, which was really, 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 really good that they did that because it was kind of...
kind of offensive. So, yeah. um. <laughs> we, we'd had, the, I think this is a funny story. We'd had a character that we'd named and we'd asked some people who spoke German. We said like, you know, what should this character be named? And um, it was like a, a, the wife of one of the characters. And they said, oh, this is a good name. Or like maybe we'd Googled the name and they'd said, yeah, that'll do or something. Um, and then when we were working with the, with uh, he came across the line, he said, and the character had been called Alter. And he was like, Alter, no, this isn't, I, why is he calling his wife this word? And we were like, oh, what is it? You know, that's her name. And he's like, no, this isn't a name. And we were like, what are you, what are you talking about? He said, this is like, it's like kind of calling someone like the old ball and chain. It's like, <laughs> like um, my my old woman, like that's a bit like really disrespectful. So yeah. um, so it's we had changed not in the character at all. Yeah. I think he was like, does he not like his wife? Yeah, and meanwhile the story is about how much he like is desperately in love with his wife. So um, <laughs> that was uh, that was a good pickup. But yeah, it, in answer to your question, there's nothing on the cutting room floor audio. There's a there's a lot of dialogue on the cutting room floor prior to setting foot in the booth. Like there are a lot of scenes that didn't yeah. make it. Um, for however big the game is, it could have been yeah. even bigger. Yeah. Um, but yeah, once we were and in, I think we were like, in. Um, definitely at the start of all of the actors' time with us, we would go through the scene once for them to get the feel of it. And we would record that because we record everything. So any audio person would know everything. Um, and then the next time through is likely to be their best take. And then any um, lines that weren't quite right or they were flubbed or they... Um, didn't have the intention behind them, then we would retake those. And um, often the actors would loop a line until um, someone liked it. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. No worries. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, my question is more about voice direction. Um, was there anything in particular, particular that you learnt during the process of making this game? But also, on the same vein, anything that you found really useful that you had learned previously before starting this project? Yeah, great question. Um, I think that there's, your question makes me think of like one particular insight, which I had, um, I had learned prior and it's sort of like a generalized principle, but this game was a time where I really got to road test it and find out just how true it is. Um, in directing actors in a vocal performance, um, showing them how to say the line, doing like, say it like this, is absolute last resort. Um, and you won't believe how much better what the actor comes up with naturally is compared to what's in your head. You might have an idea in your head of like, oh, I want the line said exactly like this. But if you are able to give words about the texture of what you're looking for or the intention behind it or what this character is trying to do with saying this rather than saying, oh, say the line this way, repeat after me. Um, one of two things will happen. They'll either do exactly what's in your head by you just like communicating that to them or they'll do something even better than that. Mm. Um, and whereas typically if you, like whatever you're trying to convey when you say, say the line like this, um, there's usually something that you're not able to get across when you're trying to like instruct in that way. Um, and it usually just leads to a lot of confusion for the actor and um, and then getting really in their head of like, oh, I'm being, I'm repeating back what I'm hearing, but they're still getting me to do it again. And what am I getting wrong? Whatever. The other thing that I think is a good general principle is not like doing whatever you can to not get stuck on the one line. If there's a line that you want a particular kind of way, you've asked for it two or three times and it's not working, just pretend that it is. Um, say, great, we've got it, move on, and then come back and say, oh, I want to take another look at this scene, let's have another go, because it's really, there is there is a kind of strange alchemy to working with actors where um, it's kind of like I think people in, like, basketball talk about, like, when a particular player is, like, hot and they've got, or, like, they've, they're going to, like, keep scoring goals or whatever. The same can be true of an actor and the opposite can be true. Like, they can, once they've failed the line two or three times, they can fail it. 40 times, you know, whereas if you just left that alone, went to some other stuff and then came back to it, the, the next try will be perfect. Um, so, yeah, on top of just the stuff I was saying about, like, working with whatever the needs are of the person in front of you and just being really super attentive to that and not having any preconceived ideas about... Um, oh, actually, on that note, sorry, I'll, this is the last thing I'll say, is that we did have, like, a, a rough schedule for roughly how much content that we needed to get through per actor per session in order to make time. But I didn't ever push that hard in the first session. The first session was always, because we with most of our actors, we had about four half-day sessions scheduled in. 
And on the first session, I just tried to work at, a, at an even pace. Then you see how much you've gotten done and then you see whether the rest of the timeline you've got is realistic rather than trying to push that timing from the beginning because it's just the number one way to make someone uncomfortable is to mm-hmm. make them feel like they're behind time. Um, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. No worries. I should mention that Georgia is a very accomplished theatre director also and that's very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is my first video game. So, um, But yeah, other, other experience is good. Hi. Hey. Um, uh, I just got to think of what my question was. Um, I, so I'm a music composer, sound designer, and the game we're working on at the moment, we've kind of taken our first little step into doing voice acting, where we're just doing the Zelda-like grunts and then yeah. having like subtitles. Um, and we kind of, in our next project, kind of want to maybe get into doing voice dialogue, but we're just worried about like. If you don't nail it, I feel like it just it just it kind of can detract more than if you just had subtitles. Do you have any like thoughts on like I don't know what's the what are the most critical things to get right, especially when you're on a budget to like get an appropriate level of quality? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, I feel like you're gonna have great thoughts on this. Mm. I have. Um, my my thought is before getting into what what can you get right in the studio on a budget, etc. It's just thinking about what is the precise reason why you're fully voicing your game. Um, I find that this is this is very shameful to admit as, as someone who's just like voiceover directed this whole game. But when I play games that are fully voiced, I find quite often that I skip through the dialogue at quite a fast rate and skip over half of the voiceover performance. Um, and I think that you know, for example, um, personally, I'm a big fan of Spiritfarer, and they do that thing where they have like a character sound, and then you're reading the, the titles at your own pace. Um, But in our game, things taking the time that they take and listening to every word that someone's saying and the fact that the whole thing is in real time is inherently the point of the game. Um, And so that was a real reason to go into full voice. Um, So that my my advice would just be think like definitely not saying don't do it preferably do it because it's really fun and it can make something really beautiful but just really think about why it is that this project requires full voice Mm. um when we first did our vertical slice i like as a the same as a lot of game audio people i work quite in the box and i don't actually work in studios that often and that's changed um with this game but i was not experienced working in a studio And our protagonist was too close to a window the entire time. And reflection is just the worst thing to get out of any voice. It's just the worst. Mm -hmm. And and it was awful. And we had to live with that sound for six years. (laughs) And it was so bad. And it was really embarrassing. Like, whenever any other audio people would listen to it, they'd be like, is it? is this in different spaces? Like, no, it's the same space. It's just in a different place in the space. And um, Jason, the director, uh, claimed that he couldn't tell the difference. Um, but then when the actual voiceover went in, he could tell the difference. And then he was like, oh. <laughs> um, but, yeah, really, like, um, one of the key reasons why I made sure to have an assistant in the studio was because I knew that... I could get a bit flustered and rush sound checking um, because there's an actor there staring at you while you say, talk about your day and your breakfast and your dog and just keep talking, keep going, keep going. And then while you're having a whole other conversation and just being like, blah, 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 blah. Um, And like I really pressed on to Alison of like, don't let me cut sound check short, you know. Um, And we told all the actors that sound check would go for an hour and that, you know, it's because it's a video game and because we have four studios and because we have to be really precise about it. Um, and, like, that's true, but it was also just so that I would feel less pressure to speed up sound check because it had to be right and there had to be no goddamn reflections. Um, and you know, Jason and Georgia... Um, were also really, really supportive of that. Like, we would stop a session and go back and be like, oh, I think I heard a dog bark or something and I want to check if we got it. Um, And that was such a huge part of it as well, that, you know, whoever you're working with, whoever's directing the actors um, or, you know, is trying to make you do your job faster. Like, I 
obviously you'll sue a union member, but um, whoever's trying to crunch you, like they actually have that respect that you need to get it right um, and that you do need to listen to those details and all of that. Um, I think that was a big thing, just working through how flustered I got. Um, I think there was also a session where Alison couldn't make it and um, after the two hours that we all, we all knew was our kind of peak of that's how long I can listen so closely for before I need a break, um, I had to stop. And, like, none of us were super feeling it on that day, but it did come down to me to make the call to be like, I can't actually guarantee that the rest of this is going to be any good. Let's just stop. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's also kind of crosses into just listening to yourself when you're working as well. But, yeah, that was a real big one. I think the last thing on this, because I'm conscious of time, we got one more question, but the, the thing that I've also been thinking is... Um, in terms of making it cost efficient for yourself, the, I can't overstate the value of pre-prep. Mays oh, had done yeah. so much before we got into the studio, had sent such detailed instruction and like full video tutorials to the other studios we were working with, all those Excel sheets, all those Pro Tools files. Um, you will say it will feel, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it felt like hell, but you will save so much time and money on in terms of studio costs, actor costs, etc. if you just really thoroughly do the pre-work mm -hmm. yeah thank cool. you thanks so much all right well we've got time for one more uh first of all obviously congratulations it's a beautiful game and thank you. it's a great talk um thank you. i had a really quick question we're tooling up at the moment and i wanted to know what was the most time intensive part of actually you've done the recording and you're going towards implementation was it editing uh the rx work that you had to do or, or something like that um yeah it's slicing um, because, because it's not a film and because we weren't going line by line in sync with the vision, um, it meant that the timing wasn't always to the markers. Um, and pretty much, you know, because it's a video game, we didn't have to sync with anything except the actors. So it was the actors that really made up the timing. We had a magic number that we were using for a little while, as I mentioned, to make the speech bubbles come up for long enough. Um, but eventually the speech bubble timing all snapped to the WAV files that we implemented. But it was, yeah, it was the slicing. And um, actually, RX11 has just come out, and now it shows you the words that everyone is saying, so. <laughs> Help, helpful timing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that would have, that would probably also help the manual part of QA as well, so. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks again, everyone, so much for being here. Um, have a good GCAP. Have a good MIGWA. Yeah, thanks.